All right, so well, let's get started with the final module. So Surav is going to start out, and he's going to talk about in vivo genome editing. Um, yeah. I know a couple of you guys have asked about that, so hopefully you get some of your questions answered here. Um, and then from there, we'll discuss RNA targeting enzymes, and finally, um, issues about specificity. And then we'll have, again, another like 15 minutes of questions. But um, feel free to also ask your questions during the presentations. Hi guys, I'm Saurav. I'm a postdoc in the Zhang lab. And today I'm going to be basically talking about in vivo somatic genome editing in a living organism. Uh, we've had a lot of questions about that. We've also had a lot of questions about knock-in models. That is not, unfortunately, something I'm going to be talking about right now. But feel free to ask questions after. And feel free to ask questions, stop me and ask questions during. So to start off, do you guys know who this is? Hands up if you know who that is. All right. So for the rest of you who don't know who this is, this is Luke Cage, and he is a Marvel superhero. And there's a television series on Netflix right now that I highly encourage you to watch. It's really good. And the reason I'm bringing up Luke Cage here is because Luke Cage is a superhero, and his superpowers are that he's basically bulletproof. He has an unbreakable skin. So how do they do that? So if you go through the whole Marvel and the DC comic lines, one of the things that they do is this whole soldier serum thing, right? Because it's like, oh, like you're just invincible. These guys did something different, right? So what they did was, so in a, in a reveal, and you know, spoiler alert here, what they did was they basically used a process called CRISPR to edit this guy's genome somatically, like, you know, as an organism, and fuse another piece of DNA with this. So the question I want to come to here in, uh, in, in, in my talk is, how do you go from your Cas9 right here as a molecule to basically making Luke Cage. Let's take a step back maybe, right? It's a little bit more science fiction. How do you go from Cas9 to basically treating human diseases, right? You have a human, has a disease. One of the biggest, biggest challenges of Cas9 is how do you go from here to the clinic? If you take even one more step back, it's how do you basically use Cas9 now to treat mouse models of human disease, or even to further understand how the disease progresses inside the mouse. And, wh and one, of, one of the big challenges to do that is delivery, 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 right? How do you get this Cas9 into the mouse? And while it's, you know, you know, multiple speakers before have talked about ways in which you can basically modify cells to introduce these, uh, these genome editing tools inside them, whether it's through transient transfection, nucleofections, using of lentiviruses, and even nanoparticles. Much, much more difficult to translate that into a living organism, here just a mouse, right? And one of the key things that we have learned from clinical trials through the last 50 to 100 years for editing tools as, as well as gene replacement tools is that the, the roadblock, the, the rate limiting step seems to be the, the efficacy of the delivery. And you know, it's been a huge problem in the RNA field, for example. So one of the things that, so I'm, throughout this talk, I'm going to talk about this magic, magic tool called AAVs that are extremely bioactive. And what, that, what I mean by that is that this seems to be a good way to introduce a gene that you want inside of an organism. So what is an AV? So an AV is essentially a nanoparticle-sized viral DNA delivery tool, right? So it has a proteinaceous capsid, uh, uh, which you can see right here, which basically encapsidates uh, a small, you know, 4.8 kb transgene of your choice, right? And so the general organization, if you wanted to do an AV experiment, right, so whether it's for gene replacement or for gene editing, is basically you need to have some common elements. You need to have these repeat elements called ITRs, which are from the viral genome that you don't need to worry. But more importantly, what you need is a transgene that you want to express. You know, in our case, it could be Cas9, it could be the guides. You need a promoter that is suitable for the transgene, and you need a poly A. And one of, so here is one, one cool thing about this. Just optimal use of the right promoter can basically drive tissue-specific expression, right? So if you use a promoter that is active, active only in neurons, you're going to essentially end up limiting expression only to neurons. So that's your first step of regulation uh, inside an organism. Further, AVs are kind of special, right? They come in different flavors. And what I mean by flavors is they, they come in different serotypes, where AV 1 through 12, and there are like a you know, few more. 
And the interesting thing about these serotypes is what they are different between each other is not the transgene, but obviously it's, it's different in the capsid amino acid constitution. And these differences, what they do is they change the interaction of this AAV to a glycan receptor on the host cell surface. So for example, AAV2 will bind SHPG, which you find a lot on the liver. On the other hand, AV9s can bind galactose, which you find a lot on the brain endothelial cell line, which means that AV2s are kind of good at, you know, transducing the liver, but are pretty bad at transducing the brain after systemic delivery, whereas AV9 seems to be much better at crossing the blood-brain barrier and going across. And it's, you know, I'm, I'm presenting a very simplistic and reduced concept, but it essentially is true. Furthermore, you can es essentially shuffle or redesign the AV capsid to have tropism to a particular cell population that you want. And you know, feel free to come back later and ask me how that is done. So let's just go over on why AV vectors are gaining so much uh, exposure in the clinical market. And they have some really, really cool features. They are non-pathogenic. They're not going to cause a disease in an organism. There is no toxicity that has been reported in clinical trials, and that's a big thing. Because if you guys remember gene therapy from like 10, 15 years ago, one of the key things was that you had a lot of toxicity um, in, in the patients, which led to a lot of trials being shut down. They, also mediate long-term and stable expression of the transgene. Now I'm gonna to come to this point a little later, and it's not necessarily as good for genome editing as it is for gene replacement. But let me tell you that this long-term is really long-term. I mean, you can have this transgene expressed stably inside a human for, for now 10 to 12 years counting. These can infect both mitotic and post-mitotic cells, so you don't have to worry about whether your cell is a neuron or whether it's a hepatocyte. You can basically infect what you want has pretty low to almost negligible immunogenicity, and that's a huge factor because one of the key things that limits clinical trials or preclinical trials is that the, the, essentially a lot of the viral vectors, like adenoviruses, mount a very strong B cell and T cell response, which prevents their activity. Further, it does not integrate into the host genome, so you're not gonna have leukemia because your AV, AVs have integrated, or AV vectors have integrated in a host genome. Instead, they persist as very stable extra chromosomal elements. So a lot of things that are very, very good with it. So to leverage this for gene editing, one of the things that people have done, and I'm gonna go through the kind of the history of how AVs have been used for gene editing, but it's essentially sort of a workshop kind of class in how you can design your own experiments. So one thing that you can do, and one thing that has been done very robustly with SPCAS9, as people in the lab have, have talked extensively about in, uh, in the introduction, is basically you can have a dual vector system. So it's two AV particles that need to co-infect the same cell. And on one AV particle, you put this SPCAS9, driven by a promoter of your choice, usually a very, very short promoter, and you know, a poly A. And on the other one, you basically put your U6, which is a Pol3 promoter, driving your small RNA or your sgRNA expression. And you have a GFP here as basically a localization marker. And the reason you need to split this up into two is this. sp casin is pretty huge. So AVs have an upper packaging limit of around 4.8 kb, right? Your sp casin is 4.2 kb. So you essentially left it only 600 base pairs to do what you want with the rest. And you're, you know, you're, so hence you'll have to use like a short promoter, you'll have to use you know, a shorter, um, shorter uh, promoter like MECP2 or something like EFS, which is a shorter version of EF1 alpha. Regardless, if you do direct injections, what people in our lab, uh, Lukash and Matthias have shown in 2014 is that if you do injections with these, you get pretty efficient gene knockdown, as you can see here with MECP2 knockdown in the mouse hippocampus. That's good, but there are some slightly unanswered questions and something that is still not there. And one of the big things is direct injection, right? We skipped over it a little briefly. And the problem with direct injections is that whether you do an intrahepatic injection to target the liver or an intracranial injection to target the brain, it's a highly invasive process. You don't want it, first off. And the second problem is, for a lot of the disorders that we have, say, you know, autism or any of the neurological disorders, it doesn't affect just one part of the brain. It's gonna affect the whole brain. So Typically, to address something like that, you're gonna to have to inject pretty much for the whole brain. And if you think this is exaggerated, do reflect that the first AV trial for a brain disease involved 12 injections into a single patient in the brain, which is crazy, right? So the way around it is obvious, right? You go with a more system, with a more systemic delivery approach. So whether it's in a human, or whether you, know, you use it in a mouse model of a human disease by tailwind injections. 
So that's what we did. So in our lab, you know, Winston, uh, Le, and, um, and Anne basically came up with a strategy where they used this smaller Cas9 ortholog called SA Cas9. So instead of being 4.2 KB, it's now 3 KB, which is, you know, it fits in really, really well. And you can use a very, very, very nice liver specific promoter, like a TBG promoter, and you know, feel free to substitute to it, uh, like synapsin or anything that you want. And you can have the guide and the U6 promoter essentially in the same AV cassette. And it's pretty good for systemic because if you think about how the transduction is gonna work, the chances that with systemic delivery, you're gonna get co-infection in say a remote location like the brain, you know, you're injecting the periphery, you wanna to go to the brain, is pretty low. The reason it worked in the last one is because you're injecting it locally at a very high concentration at the same site. So what they saw with this technology was that they, uh, they got pretty efficient, they got pretty efficient editing of the, uh, of the PCSK9, and not just that, they also got a very f huge functional, significant functional reduction in the psyllium cholesterol, which is what you're supposed to. So PCSK9 is a cholesterol um, gene, essentially, it's a cholesterol gene. So if you have higher PCSK9, you're gonna have um, an effect on the cholesterol levels. So they saw a pretty robust decrease. So this is, I would say, one of the most useful things. If you wanna do genome editing in your mouse, and you want, uh, you want to basically reach, instead of a very small population, you want to reach a big population or a whole liver or a whole tissue, this is the system that you should be using. Now, sometimes when you want to dissect out functions of multi-gene families, or if you want to basically use it to uh, address, uh, address disorders when more than one gene has been affected, what are you gonna do? So one thing that you can do is you can edit multiple genes at the same time with the sp cas Again, it's the same system as what I mentioned is from the same paper, is that you basically have U6, a whole tandem panel of U6 basically driving individual guides, right? And with that, it's pretty successful. Again, with local direct injection, you can see that you get up to like 35.4% editing. This is pretty high. Uh, editing of all the three genes that you're targeting. So very potent tool. But the problem again comes that, look, you're having to add 100, like a hundred, like a hundred base pair or 150 base pair U6 cassette every time you want to add a gene. And it's going to pile up and it's going to add up pretty quickly. So the way around it is to use one of our new nucleases called CPF1. Now CPF1 has this pretty interesting ability of being able to process its own array. What that means is that it, will, it can basically cleave its own, own guide sequence. So what, do you, what that ends up meaning for you and me who want to do genome editing in a mouse is that you can use a single U6 promoter, any Paul 3 promoter, to drive expression of multiple genes in an arid format. So you don't need a separate U6 for all of them. And with this, you essentially end up getting uh, a 16.9% editing of the three loci that we, have, that, uh, that we have chosen to edit with this. And again, your size limitations are 4.8, so you have to be cognizant of that. And this has been super successful, I mean, super successful within a certain limitations in preclinical trials. I mean, there are several preclinical trials that have succeeded, I would say much beyond expectations on how well it could edit. I mean, here's a couple of examples where they basically edited uh, a gene that was involved in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Here's an example where they basically edited the gene that was involved in a disease, uh, a liver disease called tyrosinemia, and they got pretty, pretty efficient editing. And one of the things I wanna point out here, which has a lot of implications for you and me who wanna design such experiments, is the choice of target. So one of the things about this system is that in tyrosinemia, the liver hepatocytes die unless you're editing them. So if, you're, if you have a tissue like the liver where if you don't edit a cell, it's gonna die, and if you edit a cell, it's gonna expand and regenerate, you have a situation in which, in their case, although they see like less than 1% of the cells are edited at the time of editing, over six months, that 1% becomes a total 100% of the whole liver is edited, just because the cells that were not edited just died off, and the cells that were edited could basically regenerate and remake the whole liver. And it's a pretty successful, and this is something I would highly recommend for those of you who want to think about liver diseases in particular. I would like to end by seeing where the field is probably gonna go in the next one or two or three or five years. And that is coming back to an old topic about long-term and stable expression, right? So for gene replacement therapy, where you've lost a gene and you were just replacing a gene, it's pretty great if you can have stable expression for the rest of your life, because it's a pretty important gene. However, for genome editing, that's not the case. The Cas9 is gonna edit, and it's, you don't need Cas9 after that. 
Worse up, if you have the Cas9 and the guides hanging out for a long time, what you're gonna see is you're gonna plateau off on the on-target effect, and you're gonna keep increasing the off-target effect as time goes, right? So the way around it is to not use maybe gene delivery methods, but use basically nucleus RNP complex delivery methods by transient, by transient delivery. And here it is summarized pretty clearly here uh, from, from a slide from AdGene where essentially a plasmid-based or an AV-based method has to go through three or four steps. It has to go through transcription, translation, and then assembly. Whereas if you just have a method to deliver a pre-assembled complex, you can get over these problems. And some of these methods include, like say, cationic lipid nanoparticles, which can enter the cell, but can also basically uh, enclose a, a Cas9 guide RNA complex. And obviously there are a lot of clinical implications for that, right? A, it's, it's super safe. The Cas9 is not hanging out in your cell. Uh, you have improved specificity for the reason I mentioned before, and you also have rapid nucleus activity. So if you see here, as compared to plasma transfections, which you know, in a cell itself takes about you know, 30 to 40 hours, to reach peak, peak uh, mRNA expression, um, and which in vivo is probably much longer. Uh, with protein delivery, you can see your peak in a very, very short amount of time in less than 10 hours. So that's where I'd like to end. It's a very brief presentation. This is the state of the art with in vivo genome, uh, somatic genome editing. Feel free to ask me any questions now or later. Um, if there are no immediate questions, I think we'll just go on to the next talk on RNA targeting enzymes. Um, and then if you do have questions for Surav, we can uh, do that at the end of the presentations. So Jonathan and Omar. Cool. Thanks for waiting. Um, so as Rai said, today Omar and I will give a little bit of a discussion of some new ways we can target genes or RNA using things that kind of go beyond Cas9 and may have some future uh, utility for you. So just to start out, for a lot of people, CRISPR and Cas9 are really synonymous, and or maybe CRISPR and CPF1, but really that there, there's an entire constellation of possible CRISPR systems out there. So if you look at this uh, kind of layout of all the different CRISPR systems, you can see that your familiar Cas9 and CPF1 are here, but you have all these other class one systems that have all these different uh, proteins in them, and also you have th some similarities. So the question that we started out with was, can we actually use similarities between CRISPR systems to discover novel CRISPR systems? So the similarity that I'd like to point out uh, is the spacer insertion capability of all CRISPR systems. So in natural CRISPR systems, you need to be able to adapt to novel phage insults. And the way you do that is by inserting spacers. So you can see that Cas1 is a shared property of almost all CRISPR systems. So we wanted to say, can we use a shared property to find new ones? So what we first did is that we seeded using Cas1 and we looked at all bacterial genomes, about 27,000, and we could blast Cas1 against contigs and see where it occurred in the context of other open reading frames. When we had those open reading frames, we could look at them and see that there were genes that we knew were annotated in yellow, but also unknown orange genes that could be potential CRISPR effectors or new CRISPR tools. Then we could take these new tools and then compare them to other blast hits and iterate the process until we could actually find candidate CRISPR systems that could be actually used as tools. So we actually found a couple good hits that were good validation. So first, this system found Cas9 and CPF1, which we would expect because they're known uh, single effector CRISPR tools. But we found a whole set of new CRISPR proteins, which we call the C2CXs, for class two candidates one, two, and three. So there were three candidates, and first I'd like to highlight class two candidate one and class two candidate three, C2C1 and C2C3. We're not gonna talk about these much today because they're actually quite similar to CPF1 if you look at the layout of the uh, RUV-C domains. So we thought and later showed that they were DNA endonucleases. And as a tool, more DNA endonucleases are nice, 
but we wanted to focus on the other class two candidate, C2C2. So you can see here that there are no RubC domains, but there are these purple boxes. And if we look closer at the domain organization of C2C2, we can see that although it has no apparent DNA endonuclease domain, these purple R4XH motifs are actually well, very well conserved and that they're what we would call HEPN motifs. So the HEPN superfamily is actually a large superfamily of metal independent endoRNases. And these show up in various toxin antitoxin systems in bacteria. They show up in certain human proteins like Saxon. But they also show up, thankfully, in other CRISPR systems. So the type 3 systems, which have many different components and have been shown to target RNA as well as DNA, both have in the type 3A and type 3B systems HEPN domains. So CSX1 in type 3B and CSM6 in the type 3A system. So we thought that given this information, perhaps the C2C2, which contains HEPN domains, would be a programmable RNA targeting CRISPR effector, which we could turn into an RNA targeting tool. So here's the locus for C2C2. Um, here's the protein, and here is that Cas1 adaptation protein, as well as the Cas2, which is accompanying that. And it's CRISPR array, so the actual array of repeats and spacers that encode the memory of the CRISPR system. So first to determine whether C2C2 was actually a functioning system, we sequence it. So we took the actual uh, bacterium from Le Patricia Shahi, and we did small RNA sequencing, and we found that the CRISPR array was actually expressed and processed into distinct peaks with a five prime direct repeat, as well as a 18 to 28 nucleotide spacer region that encoded variable spacers. So we wanted to say, I think, can we show this is an RNA targeting exclusive tool, as well as find the guide rules for retargeting it in bacterial systems. So we used a phage screening approach. So MS2 phage, you may be familiar with the MS2 protein from talks like the SAM talk, but the phage is actually an RNA phage and it infects E. coli. So what we did is we took the MS2 genome and we actually computationally derived all of the possible spacers that tile the MS2 genome. And so this phage genome is about 3,700 nucleotides, and so we had about 3,700 spacers targeting the phage genome. So we could synthesize these spacers, and just like you saw in the screening module, we could actually create a library of plasmids. In this case, instead of having just our Cas9 or C2C2, we have the C2C2 along with all the other elements of the locus because we wanted to have as little bias in our determination of whether this worked or not. But we constructed a library similar to the previous approaches. And then we could actually put this library into E. coli and expose them to phage and then see if any E. coli first survived and second, upon sequencing, if there were any sorts of rules to what E. coli survived and what didn't. So we first checked at uh, the distribution of our spacers, and we saw that as you increase the amount of phage, you get more and more spread in your distribution, which is indicative of a resistance mechanism selecting certain effective spacers as well as non-effective spacers dying off. So this would increase the variance in the population. To confirm our top hits in the screen, we actually resorted to a plaque drop assay. So here you see a black lawn of E. coli and little plaques of white death occurring. So these are dilutions of MS2 phage you spotted onto the E. coli. And you can see that when we don't have any sorts of defense mechanisms or a, a targeting spacer, there's actually a quite large range of death. But when we introduce spacers that show, were in our screen to uh, shown to confer resistance, you can see that there's much less death occurring and that only at the very high concentrations of phage, we actually get death on our E. coli. So you can quantify this, and what we found is that our top spacers all conferred several magnitudes of resistance. So that was a good indication that the system actually works to target RNA from an invading phage. We also looked computationally at which spacers were actually enriched or depleted, and we found that there was a motif similar to a PAM, but we call it, since it's only a, a single site, we call it a 
protospacer flanking uh, site. And you can see that it's a single base that can be C, U, or A. So essentially anything that's not G. So with this restriction, we wanted to see if we could also recapitulate activity of C2C2 in vitro. So what we did is we purified C2C2 and incubated it with a labeled target. And we, you can see that only in the presence of CRNA and the C2C2 and the absence of EDTA, so it's a magnesium dependent process, do you get these cleavage patterns. And you can see that, as you might expect from Cas9, you'd only expect one cleavage pattern, one band. But you can see that we have multiple different bands, really four here. And we actually sequence these reactions. And you can see that these cleavage sites occur at exposed uracils. So we, we think that C2C2 is actually binding the target and then cleaving promiscuously along the target at these exposed uracil sites. So one way we wanted to test that was actually by modifying the target. So we had a loop and we had variable bases and it's a little bit hard to see with the lights, but um, only when this loop is a uracil do you actually get cleavage of your target and this occurs in a C2C2, in a CRNA dependent fashion. Apologize for the exposure. So given the targeting conditions, we wanted to see whether the other biochemical mechanisms could allow us to turn this into a programmable binding tool. So as I discussed before, there are two HEPN domains and they have catalytic arginines and histidines. So we wanted to see whether by mutating the arginines or the histidines, we could actually have an effect on the cleavage. So we actually mutated each individual residue and you can see that only in the presence of all four catalytic residues do you get cleavage. And you might expect that these two domains would actually be uh, complementary to each other and that we could, with one functioning domain, we would still get cleavage. But uh, with HEPN domains, the proteins often dimerize. So this is expected. And we also took the entire locus and did a plaque drop assay. And you could, we saw a similar thing, that only with the active uh, residues did we get a uh, interference and protection from the phage. So the last question we wanted to ask biochemically was if we disable these residues, can we still have an effective binding tool? Because you can imagine a chassis for binding would be very useful in vivo in mammalian cells. So we did an electrophoretic mobility shift assay and you can see that this catalytically dead mutant still binds quite tightly and you can see the characteristic shift that occurs when there's an on target but not in the case of the reverse complement off target. So by mutating these residues, we have a RNA programmable RNA binding tool that binds quite effectively. So, go on, yeah. yeah. All right, thanks. Okay, so I'm going to kind of summarize um, what Jonathan just talked about in terms of what a Disney system can do, and then talk about kind of uh, the interesting things you can do with it as a tool in mammalian cells, which might be kind of more relevant for, for you guys. Um, so this is what the, the locus looks like. And um, in, in the cell, it gets expressed into C2C2 protein and uh, CRISPR array, which eventually then gets processed into small mature CRISPR RNAs. These complex with the protein and prime the cell for some sort of RNA infection. Um, when the cell gets exposed to an RNA phage, the complex is then primed and ready to recognize specific sites in the phage genome and cause cleavage in single-stranded regions around the target binding area, and you get cleavage and protection. So um, an interesting thing to ask is how specific is the target recognition? Um, is it, will it you know, recognize off-target sites? And this might be something um, that you worry about in mammalian cells, right? So that's, we investigated this in bacteria by mutating the actual spacer of the CRISPR RNA with single mismatches as shown in red or double mismatches as shown in red over here. And what we see for the single mismatches is you do see um, a slight loss in activity, but with the double mismatches you see complete loss, which suggests that the C2C2 target recognition is fairly specific. It might be permissive to single mismatches, but is not to double mismatches. Um, so to kind of summarize the, the bacterial space of CRISPR systems before I move into the tool aspect, um, you know, it's just kind of interesting to look at all the single enzyme systems we've 
kind of characterized, Cas9, TPF1, TTC1, TTC2, because they have a lot of similarities, but also a lot of cool differences that make them unique and relevant for different applications. Um, so, uh, okay, so an interesting question then to ask is why is it useful to have a you know, programmable RNA binding protein? Um, and it, it's kind of interesting because CRISPR, you know, was preceded by talons and zinc fingers, but the kind of RNA world doesn't have an equivalent of that that's uh, easy to kind of engineer and program. And if you did have an RNA programmable protein, there's a lot of things you could do, including you know, binding to 5 prime UTRs and recruiting ribosomes to enhance translation or repress translation. You could bind to splicing areas to block or recruit splicing factors to change um, actual isoform structures. You can recruit fluorophores to track you know, transcript localization in real time in cells. Um, you can actually alter localization of transcripts by dragging them using different localization sequences, um, as well as degrade RNA and even target like non-coding RNAs. So there's a rich space of applications, there just hasn't been the right tool to allow for that. Um, and so we wanted to show if CGC2 could be used for some of these applications. Um, the first one we went after is just mammalian RNA knockdown. Um, so to assess how good it is at knocking down RNAs, we developed a three plasmid system. Um, we expressed the CRISPR RNA on one plasmid, the CGC2 protein on a different plasmid, and then we use this reporter system which uh, expresses two different flavors of luciferase. And we target the green uh, luciferase, GLUC, and we use the CLUC as kind of a dosing control to normalize and reduce variability. Um, when we do this, we uh, express the CRISPR RNA on two promoters, a U6 promoter and also a tRNA promoter, which is a different small RNA promoter. And we also compare it to a U6 expressed shRNA to see how well it compares to RNAi using this system. And what we found for just two different guides that we picked um, is that we do get kind of 50% knockdown and it's actually better than this exact same sequence for shRNA. So we found that kind of promising um, as a first step to show that uh, this could work for knockdown. Um, and so we also wanted to see, could it be, uh, like, how, what's the specificity uh, uh, related to RNAi? Because um, RNAi is kind of notorious for having a lot of off targets and, um, you know, a lot of large RNAi screens like Achilles um, uh, have too much variability sometimes to actually make significant claims about dependence. So um, we did uh, total mRNA sequencing um, with one of the guides and saw a distribution like this. And for CTC2, we got a distribution like this, which just visually, um, you can see that it's much tighter and you're perturbing kind of the transcript space a lot less. Um, and if you actually do a differential expression analysis to try to see how many significant um, differentially regulated off targets there are, you see, find for CTC2 that none of the transcripts are differentially regulated and you actually get around 45 for shRNA. Um, now this is for just one guide on a reporter system but it's kind of a first promising step to show um, that the system could be useful for knockdown and we're gonna start characterizing it on endogenous genes. Um, and the other interesting thing to think about is because it's not a essential endogenous protein like RNAi, it's hard to, you know, to engineer the RNAi pathway because it's all essential proteins to the cell. You know, CDC2, you can imagine mutagenizing it, adding fusion proteins to make it better, um, you know, and so on, so. Another application we wanted to look at was whether we could use CTC2 to image uh, transcripts in cells. Um, so one experiment was, to, it's kind of a toy example, but it's called a stress granule assay. So if you add sodium arsenate to cells, um, you start getting like these stress granules and a lot of RNAs localize to the granules and one of them is beta actin mRNA. Um, and so this is just a, uh, uh, shows you what those stress granules look like. You get these large, uh, you know, green circles in the cytoplasm. Um, and so if we do this with CTC2, but this time we have uh, CTC2 mCherry uh, uh, tagged with a guide targeting beta actin or CTC2 with a non-targeting guide, what you see is you can start to see the stress granules form um, when you target beta actin, but you don't see that with a non-targeting guide. You just see kind of um, diffuse expression in the cell. So this is kind of just the first uh, hint that this might be useful for tracking RNA localization in cells as well. Um, and then the last application I want to talk about that's kind of interesting is the idea of translational upregulation. So with Cas9, a lot of people have tried to do transcriptional 
activation, but that's not always ideal because a lot of times transcriptional activation might not actually result in more protein because um, of feedback pathways. So we also developed a reporter system to try to test this out, and the idea is you express CLUC with a ribosome binding site, and on the same transcript, you have GLUC downstream, and because there's no ribosome binding sites here, you actually get very poor expression of the, of the GLUC. And so, um, and then what you do is you, uh, you know, tr put different perturbations in the cell, and then you normalize the GLUC expression to CLUC. Um, and so when we use one uh, initiation factor EIF yeah, for uh, E fused to CGC2, we actually can get some level of translational upregulation compared to the control. Um, so, and this is just a kind of a first example. We're also following this up on endogenous genes to see how well this works. But um, this can be kind of cool for like screening um, and, um, and kind of other applications as well. So, um, so in summary, kind of what we talked to you about today is the idea of kind of mining CRISPR enzymes in the hopes of finding new features for genome editing. Um, you know, doing that also to find what else you can do beyond, you know, targeting DNA. So, you know, CGC2 might be quite useful for RNA. And in general, just expanding the CRISPR toolbox as much as possible so we can do more to study uh, mammalian cells. Um, and this just shows that we're really excited about what we can do in kind of the RNA world to better study um, RNA. So, um, thank you. Uh, and I guess, are we doing questions now or? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so the last talk in this module will be um, from Ian, and he will discuss specificity, both in terms of um, ways to assess specificity uh, and some recent work to improve the specificity of some of the CAS enzymes. Good. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk. Oh, no, my sticker isn't there. Um, okay, well, you can imagine that there's a, a beautiful picture of Cas9 right smack in the middle of this slide. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Cas9 specificity. You know, we just heard about um, the RNA. We're going to take a step back and start talking about Cas9 again. So I think this um, this figure sort of best illustrates the the issue of Cas9 specificity. Um, where you have on the very top here, uh, this is a a perfect match between a guide and its DNA target. You can see that we have very, very um, good cutting, 40% uh, indels. And then if we, we artificially introduce mismatches between the guide and the target, shown here in blue, um, sort of marching closer and closer to the PAM, the PAM would be over here, and um, this is the PAM distal. You see that even with, um, with tandem mismatches marching along the, the guide, there's still quite a lot of cutting, um, especially in the, the, the PAM distal half of the guide. Um, so this, this, I think, best illustrates the, the specificity issue with Cas9, and I think any of these, uh, these DNA nucleases. So the, the, first, the first consideration with this is how do you detect these off-targets? What, what are the options that you have you know that now that you know this is a problem? How do you better define the problem? And for the vast majority of experiments, um, using a, a biased off-target prediction um, by just looking at uh, alignments between your guide and, and, um, and similar DNA sequences in the genome will give you pretty much the answer, the answer that you're looking for. And there are all sorts of servers now. Um, we have the crispr.mit.edu, just chop, chop, and there's now umpteen more options where you just put in your, your guide, your guide sequence, um, and it will spit out a list of off-targets that you should be worried about. And then you can basically, by deep sequencing, um, PCR out those loci and see, okay, do I indeed have editing at this off target? Um, so, like I said, for the vast majority of experiments, this will be absolutely fine. The, um, for the sort of the, the specificity power users, there are now um, unbiased methods where basically you don't have to look under a lamppost and say, you know, I, I only have these, these, this short list of, of places I'm going to look at. I'm not going to worry about any other potential um, off targets. The unbiased methods let you say, okay, I want to know everything that's being perturbed in my cell. I want to know all the DNA breaks that are occurring as a result of my, my nucleus. So there are sort of two, two um, more commonly used methods now. Uh, one of them is BLESS, which was developed by Nicola Crusetto's lab um, at uh, Karolinska, and GuideSeq, which was developed by um, uh, Keith Jung's lab. 
Uh, so there, there's several other options. There's also digenome seq, which is uh, another sequencing based method, and, and, and several other ones. But th these are the, the ones that I know that are most commonly used. Um, so to, to sort of outline how these works, um, in, with guide seq, you, um, you transfect in your Cas9 with your guide. Um, and along with those, you transfect in small DNA um, pieces, basically, which will um, get randomly incorporated into the double strand breaks, all the double strand breaks that occur throughout the cell. And this gives you a handle to, um, to pull down and sequence the, the flanking uh, DNA sequences of, of um, both off targets and on targets, giving you sort of an unbiased profile of, of all of the DNA cuts that have occurred in the cell. This is, of course, um, involves a, a, a massive transfection of a lot of DNA, which, which becomes um, uh, an issue, especially if you want to start thinking about transitioning into in vivo um, off-target analysis. So BLESS is the other option, which we commonly use in our lab. Um, and the way that BLESS works, and it's biotin label um, enrichment and, uh, and sequencing, so the way that BLESS works is you, uh, you transfect your Cas9 into cells, um, you fix all the cells, you deprotonize them and isolate the nuclei. Uh, then you have, um, you basically um, permeabilize the nuclei, you flow in these small adapters which you see here in orange, and um, these, these adapters have a biotin label on them. And this, this um, these adapters attach onto all the double strand breaks in the cell. Then you shear up your DNA, you, uh, you add another label to it, and then you um, enrich your sequence, enrich and sequence, um, and basically you're able to pull out peaks of where all the double strand breaks are. And this gives you a, a very nice unbiased um, view, a profile of all the double strand breaks in the cell. So, so what I just outlined were sort of the ways, how do you define the problem? How do you know what your off targets are? Um, once you know that you have a problem, and you know, uh, because, of, because of what I showed you here, um, very frequently you will in this, you're very lucky, and you have a guide that has no homology to anything else in the genome, we want to have a solution. So what I'm going to talk about now is, is um, uh, an engineered variant of Cas9 that has um, no or very few off targets. Um, so, so if you look here, this is the, the beautiful image that I asked you to imagine earlier. Um, so this is a crystal structure of Cas9. And if you, if, you, if you sort of pull apart the structure, you can conceptually break down Cas9 into two different modules. You have the targeting mechanism, which is where the RNA is, and where the RNA like, squeezes in the DNA, and, and the um, DNA-RNA pairing occurs. And this is obviously the, you know, the very important part of Cas9 that allows it to recognize its target. But then you also have a stabilizing mechanism, which is um, where the other strand of DNA goes. So obviously when, you, when, when RNA and, and DNA hybridize, the other strand has to go somewhere, and that's what we see here. So um, in trying to come up with how to define off targets, why does Cas9 have off targets, the, the idea that kept popping up was that there's just, there's just too much, too much um, DNA association with, uh, with Cas9 when it recognizes its target. So what we wanted to do was not affect the targeting mechanism and allow Cas9 to still find its target, but pull back on the brakes a little bit, or pull back on the, the throttle a little bit, hit the brakes, and, and make sure that Cas9 isn't just, just grabbing onto all pieces of DNA that it can find. So to, to do this, we, we identified positively charged residues in that stabilizing mechanism, which we're gonna call the, um, the, the non-target groove the NT groove here, um, and we mutated these positively charged residues into uh, to, uh, uh, neutral residues, uh, alanines, um, and, and tested many, many different mutations uh, for reduction in off-target. So here you'll see um, in the wild type, the gray bar is the, the on-target um, for this particular um, gene, this EMX1. Um, and then the blue here are validated off-targets that we know exist for this gene, and we, we assay all of these by deep sequencing. So you can see in, in many of these cases, we don't have any improvements. Some cases, we, it makes it a little bit worse, but we do have um, one, two, three, four, five mutations that, that completely remove off-targets um, at, at EMX1, this, this particular locus. So this is very encouraging. 
Um, we showed that this also works at very better phase two. And then we, we proceeded to um, make combinations of mutants to look for uh, a Cas9 that has absolutely no off target. Um, and so we, we sort of um, honed in on, on two particular mutations. They're all triple mutations, which we call ESP Cas9 1.0 and ESP Cas9 1.1. The E stands for enhanced. Um, so with these, these two, two mutations as well as one other, we wanted to make sure that there was still um, robust on target activity. Because I told you we didn't want to disrupt the, uh, the targeting mechanism, but we wanted to disrupt the binding mechanism. So um, by, by um, assaying all these different um, loci, uh, basically testing for F effectivity, uh, we found that the, the mutants retained on target activity um, very, very close to wild type activity. So this is still going to work. On the left here is the very first figure that I showed you um, indicating the problem with Cas9 specificity. And you can see that, that we, have, we have fixed the issue with ESP Cas9 1.1 especially, where um, even in PAM distal mutations or PAM distal mismatches, um, we, have, we have basically no cutting and retain robust on-target cutting. So this is, this is exactly what we wanted. So now we have a, a Cas9 that you have much less to worry about in terms of off-target. Tar off because this is exactly the same as um, wild-type um, wild SP Cas9 for, in, in terms of applications, you, um, you can insert ESP Cas9 into any of your experiments without having to change anything. Um, the guides will still work. Everything is still exactly the same. It's just more specific. All right. Um, and this, this is actually true of, of single mutations as well, where, where single mismatches all along the guide um, are also much less tolerated. And you can see here where PAM distally, you have um, lots of mismatches, which are, are lots of cutting, which is in blue. Um, and then with ESP Cas9, everything has shifted over to white, except for this pesky little A to G, which I think is a Hogstein base pair. Um, uh, it's really, really indicating that we've, we've managed to improve the specificity of Cas9. And um, using, uh, using BLESS, which I described to you before, which is where you, you, ta you tag and pull down all the double strand breaks in the cell, um, we, were, we're, we, we know that we don't introduce new off targets um, with these mutations. We, we actually squash, squash existing off targets and, and don't create new ones. Uh, so this is, again, the un unbiased genome-wide specificity assay. So there, there's, there's, there are a few little things that I, I think are interesting and that we can learn about how Cas9 works and how specificity in general works. Um, and that's, that's we have um, this, this model now where uh, Cas9 goes and it binds its target DNA and it, it unwinds it. And one strand goes to the non-target group, which I... I described before, and the other strand goes into the, the targeting mechanism. And that this is, this is um, at least the hypothesis is that this is, this is not just a, like, one step and go. This is a, this is a dynamic equilibrium where you have uh, sort of like partial unwinding and then maybe re-zipping and then unzipping and re-zipping. And then eventually you get to a point where, where it completely unwinds and you have perfect DNA, RNA basing, base pairing. Um, and that's when you have cutting. And we think that by making these mutations, what we've done is, is push this arrow just a little bit back towards the, the unzipping phase. So it doesn't, doesn't quite go as, as enthusiastically to cutting. It, it says, OK, well, maybe this isn't the target that I'm looking for. Uh, and to, to sort of um, make this point, we, we made mutations that reverse the charge and should bi bind onto DNA um, even more tightly. And as a result, of making, making a Cas9 that binds DNA more tightly in the non-target group, we see um, an increase in off-target, a decrease in specificity. Um, so I don't know how useful this will be. If anybody can come up with a, uh, uh, an interesting experiment to have a, a less specific Cas9, uh, I'd love to come up with one. But right now, this is just an interesting mechanistic, mechanistic observation. So um, in summary, uh, SP Cas9 is um, tolerant to mismatches and is something that you need to be aware of in your experiments. Uh, it can create spurious cutting. Um, but thankfully, there are several methods to detect off targets. For most people, just going to one of the servers, um, computationally predicting the off target sites is the best way to do it. 
Um, there are, uh, for, for the um, unbiased methods like guide, seek, and bless, um, it's a little bit more labor intensive and expensive, but you get a, uh, a whole genome wide profile of off targets, and it can be very useful, um, especially if you're doing something like um, doing experiments for a therapeutic. Um, and then we've also, we've, we've developed ESP Cas9, which we, we've shown cuts efficiently and eliminates um, genome wide off targets, it's sensitive to single mismatches even. Um, and we've, we've learned a little bit about how Cas9 works as a, as a molecular machine, which I think is very, um, is very important, uh, at least from a basic science point of view. Um, and, and finally, ESP Cas9 1.1 is completely co compatible with all existing um, Cas9 workflows. So if you, if you want to use it and you want to worry less about off targets, just plop it into your experiments, it's going to go. Uh, so um, acknowledgement slide, uh, of course, Fung um, and Lin Yi Gao worked on this, en this entire experiment, uh, this entire story with me, along with um, Baron, David, and Winston. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Oh, yeah, go ahead. There, there, in some cases, we found that, that there, is, there is a little bit of a reduction in, in on-target efficiency. Yeah, so, so if, you, if you don't have a problem with using wild-type Cas9, just continue using wild-type Cas9. If you have something that has repetitive DNA, you should absolutely go and, and use ESP Cas9. It's, it's, it'll, it'll be very dependent on your experiments. What's that? Yeah. We, um, I, I don't, I don't think, I think we might have made some, some negative charges and it, it didn't kill it. It, 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 it improved specificity in some cases, but it didn't retain on target efficiency very well. If, if you, if you take, too many of the positive charges away, it absolutely kills it eventually. Um, you know, you, you, you basically, you've, you've gone over that threshold. So we're trying to, we're trying to walk that edge. So, so you're, you're, you're asking, at what time window do you assay for off targets? So it, it, depends, it depends which one of these methods you're using. If you're using um, deep sequencing, you know, 72 hours, usually everything goes to completion. You're looking for, for indels, right? So it's, it's going to accumulate. So the later you look at it, the, the more likely you're going to see the, like the, the whole profile. Say again? Right, so, so with deep sequencing, you're looking for indels. You're looking for, for mutations. For things like GuideSeq, um, you're looking for an, an insertion event, and that's also cumulative. So um, you know, you're, like, the, the, the later you look, the more events you're going to see. For something like BLESS, where you're actually detecting, you're, you're picking up the double-strand breaks themselves, you need, to, you need to be a little bit more mindful of it, because at 12 hours, you're going to see um, a certain number of cuts. Then you're right, those will get repaired. 24 hours, there'll be sort of a different, different profile. You know, it depends on, on how, how, how much Cas9 is being expressed. It depends on the guide efficiency. Um, those, are, those are all experimental parameters you need to think about. Usually, but for in, in general, 24 to 48 hours for, um, for direct double-strand break detection, um, and then 72 hours and on if you're looking for, uh, for indels. All right, thank you. Can you put the 
that will be the end of the presentations for the workshop, but we will be around for the next 15 minutes to field any final questions that you guys have. Thank you again for coming. I hope that you at least learned one thing about CRISPR that you can take back and use in your own work. Um, and like I said, we can email out the slide decks as well as a link to some of the papers that people have referred to today. So thank you very much. That's good. Yes. Oh. And, um, just, sorry, just one last thing too. You can also um, go get more information from the website um, and you can also, there's an email address there that you can send questions to.